So good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Actress for inviting me to give this presentation on the role of current stem cell therapy in malignant hematology. This afternoon, I will provide a brief introduction to the ongoing work in stem cell research, as well as the therapeutic developments for clinical use. I will mention briefly the science and the translation into the clinics and how this requires close communication with the regulations to ensure stringent quality, safety and efficacy of these stem cell therapy products. I will then focus on hematopoietic stem cells and its approved use in the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation setting and the experience gained and the lessons learnt as HSCT is truly a nexus between three promising areas of clinical research, stem cell therapies, immune modulating techniques, and the individualization of cancer therapeutics. Lastly, I will mention the limitations of the transplant as well as hematopoietic stem cells and how innovative technologies are attempting to address these problems. To move on, I think it is important to have a broad understanding of the classification of stem cells as well as the definition of stem cells. Stem cells are unspecialized cells of the human body and are able to differentiate into any cell and they have the ability to self-renew. Stem cells exist in both the embryo as well as in the adult cells. And as you can see over here, as developmental potency is reduced with each specialization step. And this means that a unipotent stem cell is not able to differentiate into as many types of cells as a pluripotent one. Totipotency has the highest differentiation potential and thus allows the cells to form both embryo as well as extra embryonic structures. While embryonic stem cells are basically an example of pluripotent stem cells that are able to give rise to all types of cells except those in the placenta. The invention of Yamanaka factors to result in induced pluripotent stem cells from somatic cells in culture marked a breakthrough in cell biology. iPSCs are able to function similarly to that of pluripotent stem cells and at the same time removes the ethical concerns specific to embryonic stem cell research. Multipotent stem cells have a much narrower spectrum of differentiation compared to that of pluripotent stem cells, but they can specialize in discrete, discrete cells of specific cell lineages, and this and hematopoietic stem cell is actually one example of it, whereby it can develop into several types of blood cells. Stem cells from different sources exhibit different capabilities of proliferation, migration, and differentiation. And this in turn determines their applications. For example, in induced pluripotent stem cells, as well as the embryonic human stem cells, these are able to produce effector immune cells, such as your T cells and NK cells, and result in the production of anti-cancer vaccines. Whereas mesenchymal stem cells are unique and they have biological properties that allow them to support other therapies as well as to deliver therapeutic agents in treating a variety of conditions. I'd like to spend some time on the biology of stem cells. Conrad Weddington's view on development was similar to that of a ball rolling down a sloping landscape which contains multiple hills and valleys as development progresses. And therefore, this implies means that cells take different paths down this landscape and so adopt different fates and uncontrolled differentiation does not occur because the hills basically act as barriers. And these are maintained by epigenetic barriers that can be overcome given sufficient perturbation. So what does this actually mean? It means that stem cells undergo a period of cell proliferation while preserving the undifferentiated state. And there must be better understanding at this molecular level, the basis of cell fate, regulation, and we must be able to deconstruct these intrinsically complex regulatory mechanisms to thus then allow the development of potential therapeutic users of stem cells. This often will involve a combination of low and high throughput experimental techniques together with computational 
algorithms. We need to have a better understanding of the dynamic core transcription factors and how this can maintain stem cell pluripotency and how this signaling interplays between the extracellular environment. Another area of active research is actually in the stem cell culture system itself, whereby various groups are attempting to optimize stem cell culture systems according to the stem cell type and the purpose of the cells in their stem state. For example, different media and conditions are employed to keep the cells either in their stem state or to allow cells to differentiate. Similarly, cell culture parameters need to be refined according to the ultimate purpose of the stem cell culture. There is a vast amount of data out there in terms of the stem cell um, therapeutics. However, these are not readily accessible and they vary in re reliability and comparability. And they are often very difficult to verify. Although there have been efforts to try and harmonize and standardize stem cell product related data, such as the formation of a minimal information about a cellular assay for regenerative medicine recommendations. However, currently almost no generally accepted standardization parameters are available to meaningfully quantify these assessments of an in vitro generated cell, cell lines, issues as well as organoid based data and therefore there has been this proposed um, uh, stem cell focused data portal which aims to offer an open source and publicly accessible link to data from native cell characterizations to the stem cell line registries and patient outcomes and this really may provide an opportunity to better understand the origin characteristics and potential of these cells which is expected to support the development of more tailored stem cell based therapeutic models. This is a very busy slide, but basically it is really to show how we can drive innovative cellular therapies forward, as well as interventions by assessing the data on the therapeutic cellular products, the donors from which the starting materials are derived, and the recipients of these therapies, as well as the therapeutic outcomes all of which is highly essential. The same aim also extends to any prelimi preliminary data generated from basic research, where scientific progress in stem cell technologies has led to a remarkable increase in the generation of data on genomic, epigenetic, transcriptomic, metabolic, proteomic, and structural and functional characteristics. However, there still are many outstanding questions of which some are listed over here. For example, who should be responsible for establishing such an overarching cell-based data portal and for ensuring its maintenance and sustainability? And to what extent can regulators actually rely on this metadata extracted from this common portal in evaluating submitted dossiers for cell-based product approval? And therefore, there is still much that we need to learn and much that needs to be done. However, all that I have presented thus far, this has shown that it has been successful and has accumulated into, um, into therapeutics that have reached the clinics as well as that have reached clinical trials. This figure shows the ongoing stem cell therapies and it's a very simplified uh, cartoon which summarizes some proven and validated therapies such as that in uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, in the eye, cornea and retina, uh, in bone and in skin. However, there is still many that are under clinical or preclinical investigations, such as the cardiovascular system uh, and neurological disorders as well. I'd like to spend some time on this slide to explain that, as you can see, if you were to go onto the clinicaltrials.gov and you, you type in stem cell therapies or stem cells, you'll probably find uh, 4,000 past, current and anticipated clinical trials with over 1,790 trials currently open. And these vast majority of trials that are open are built upon decades of research and clinical experience in the hematopoietic transplantation. Although there are still many obstacles to overcome, 
Over three decades of stem cell research are currently accumulating in remarkable clinical results. And this highlights the broad applicability of these approaches, but also the immense future prospects of cell and gene therapies using adult stem cells, as well as induced pluripotent stem cells, both in regenerative medicine and in transplantology. However, as we move forward, it is paramount that we are prudent in our approach to these therapies. Over here, Donald, Thomas and colleagues were the first to perform a bone marrow transplantation for otherwise fatal leukemias in 1950s. The studies done back then demonstrated that injections of marrow could rescue mice from otherwise lethal doses of radiation. And this was truly a breakthrough in medicine and thus established the use of hematopoietic stem cells for transplantation to treat leukemias and lymphomas, as well as primary bone marrow failure conditions. However, all that is needed is the untimely death of a man in an FDA-approved clinical trial in cell and gene therapies to then result in the field to collapse, taking the grand promise of miracle cures along with it. And this was illustrated in this young man called Jesse Gelsinger, who harbored a rare metabolic X-linked genetic disorder of the liver, where he was not able to metabolize ammonia, and therefore he participated in a gene therapy FDA-approved trial. However, his death caused the news coverage to portray the, the trial researchers as overeager and undercautious, taking shortcuts and disregarding rules meant to protect people in their care. And therefore, I pause here to say that such advanced therapeutic medicinal products truly require rigorous scientific evaluation by regulatory agencies. And marketing authorization is only granted if the product can fulfill stringent requirements for quality, safety, and efficacy. I'll now move on to the next part of my talk, which is really to focus on hematopoietic stem cells and its approved use in the transplantation setting. Hematopoietic stem cells are the therapeutic constituents of whole bone marrow and umbilical cord blood, and they have been employed successfully as a form of stem cell therapy, and this is evident in the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation setting, where it has been used to cure patients with genetic disorders such as thalassemia and uh, immune deficiencies, as well as for malignancies such as leukemias and lymphomas. And really, the procedure can be divided into two categories, that of an allogenic stem cell transplantation, as well as an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And in an allogenic HSCT, the hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells are procured from a healthy donor. And this is then used to reconstitute a patient's hematopoietic and immune system. Whereas in an autologous setting, we use the, own, the patient's own HSBCs. As of 2012, there have been over 950,000 stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell transplantations that have been performed worldwide, 42% of which have occurred in the allogenic setting and 58% in the autologous setting. This picture over here shows that because we have gained so much experience over more than 50 years in terms of defining these hematopoietic stem cells and finding the place in medicine, we now are able to use this and provide this as an accurate paradigm model system to study tissue-specific stem cells that have the potential in regenerative medicine. And that is really what this is showing here, how hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, really there's the immunotherapeutic aim, but there is also the potential of the regenerative aim. And therefore, really, uh, there is much to be learned uh, from hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And so I show this timeline that shows the milestones in the allogenic setting, where the first transplant as mentioned occurred in 1951, and after which we then went on to attempt to characterize the bone marrow cell population that comprised of the HSCTs, such as your CD34 cell surface protein. And this was identified as a marker for the subpopulation of bone marrow cells enriched for the ability to engraft and give rise to all the various cells of hematopoietic origin. After that, there was a lot of focus on how we were able to obtain these um, hematopoietic stem cells. 
And really, was it only through an invasive bone marrow harvest procedure? Or were there ways that we could actually entice these stem cells to actually come out into the peripheral circulation to, in order for us to gain, um, obtain them in a much more easier way? And therefore, this then gave rise to GCSF to help augment the mobilization of CD34 positive cells from bone marrow into the peripheral circulation, as well as identify Perexophor, an antagonist of CXDR4. CXDR4 is a chemokine receptor that upon binding with its ligand CXDL12 will help mediate the HSCs to home to the bone marrow. And therefore, you were to antagonize this pathway you would then see an increased mobilization of these CD34 stem cells, especially when given in combination with standard GCSF therapy. And this has important advice, and this was an important advancement because many of these patients are often heavily pretreated with chemotherapy, and therefore they may not mobilize adequate numbers of hematopoietic stem cells with GCSF alone. And this in turn um, will render the transplant outcomes um, not very uh, successful. Currently, peripheral blood stem cell transplants account for more than 95% of adult autologous uh, transplants, as well as more than 70% of allogenic stem cell transplants. Focus a little bit on cord blood. This was identified in 1974 and served as an alternative source of hematopoietic stem cells. And it was first used for an allogenic stem cell transplant between matched siblings in 1988. Thus far, more than 5,000 cord blood transplantations have been carried out since 1988, and there has been an increase to more than 500 per year. Cord blood is attractive because firstly, it is readily accessible, and secondly, um, the, the degree of matching between the cord blood and the recipient, what we term HLA matching, does not need to be as stringent as that of um, healthy adult donors. Uh, and that is thought to be because of the naive T cells in cord blood, although the full mechanism is not um, fully elucidated at this point of time. At the same time, there were technologies in place to expand uh, the stem cells in cord blood through the use of a double unit cord blood transplant and, there, and, the, and the evolution of less intense conditioning regimens and therefore making cord blood attractive and as an alternative source for stem cells. What else we learned was obviously the immune um, mechanism involved in a stem cell, in a hematopoietic stem cell transplant setting, where we were observing graft versus host disease and graft versus tumor or leukemia effects. And these were observed in preclinical mouse models of bone marrow transplantation. The pathophysiology of acute graft versus host disease really involves a complex cascade of humoral as well as cellular interactions between donor and host cells and T cells have been identified as the major mediators. And this was evident because of the relationship that was seen between GBHD and the rate of malignant relapse, whereby if patients develop GBHD, the rate of malignant relapse was less. And again, in stem cell, in hematopoietic stem cell grafts that were depleted of T cells, this reduced graft versus host disease and eliminated the need for immune suppression, however, gave rise to a higher rate of relapse. And therefore, building on this entire immune therapy of HSCT gave rise to the possibility of actually introducing donor um, hematopoietic um, um, stem cells into patients who would not need a full myeloablative conditioning regimen, meaning we give patients conditioning regimens um, to basically prepare them to receive these hematopoietic stem cells. Number one, it helps to uh, cause disease eradication. Number two, it creates space in the bone marrow. And number three, it will reduce the risk of rejection of the patient to the donor cells. And therefore, uh, if you use a complete myeloablative regimen, only very few patients can tolerate such toxicities from the, the chemotherapy. And therefore, being able to manipulate the immune system in such a way that you may not need a full myeloablative regimen but maybe a reduced intensity or non myeloblated and still aid engraftment and reduce the risk of rejection. Late in 1950s and in the early 1960s, then came rise of the understanding of the major histocompatibility complex, 
whereby these cluster of genes encode the HLAs that are present on antigens to T cells. And this then allowed for the selection of siblings with increased immunological compatibility as donors for patients. And if they didn't have siblings, this then allowed us to search for unrelated donors who were also immunologically compatible as donors. And this then gave rise to the National Marrow Donor Program in the United States in 1986. To increase the donor pool, um, there were also um, developments in using haploidentical donors as another source for hematopoietic stem cells. However, although HSCT is commonly used to treat leukemias and severe disorders of the blood immune system, this is still not possible to extend to all patients in need of a transplant, and therefore comes the limitations of HSCT. And these limitations are truly revolving certain issues. Firstly, an inadequate source of healthy immune compatible stem cells for transplant, technological barriers as well as immunological barriers to efficient engraftment, and significant health risks associated with the transplant procedure itself, where previously I mentioned about having to condition these patients with high doses of chemotherapy that really ablates the entire bone marrow and the immune system. Therefore, it is important that we address these challenges and therefore expand the feasibility and accessibility of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation to all who might benefit and enable this to then serve as a leading paradigm to develop newer stem cell-based therapies in the future. So hence, how have we tried to address this inadequate source of healthy and immune compatible stem cells for transplant? So as mentioned before, there is a growing practice of banking uh, umbilical cords, which contain these stem cells that has an immature phenotype and requires less stringent matching for transplant than that of adult donors. Uh, in the preclinical setting, there is talk of using human pluripotent stem cells to derive fully functional definitive hematopoietic stem cells. Um, for genetic disorders, it is possible to engineer hematopoietic stem cells to treat them instead of going through the whole um, of getting an uh, allogenic donor and so on and so forth. Uh, immune modulation, we have done that whereby using a haploidentical stem cell transplant and you give post-infusion cyclophosphamide or you do some kind of uh, manual manipulation to your stem cells with alpha-beta depletion or you actually give patients NK cells which are also known to elicit the GVL effect. I will now spend some time on the technological barriers to efficient engraftment. Methods are in place to culture and expand functional hematopoietic stem cells ex vivo. And a lot of this is trying to mimic components of the stem cell niche to enhance expansion, either through the use of bone marrow stromal cell lines or stromal cell derived ligands. Although these endeavors are encouraging, each approach affects one or more different subpopulations of blood progenitors and long term engraftment ability and clinical utility of expanded cells still remains largely unknown. Molecular approaches is another area uh, that is being um, looked into to maintain pluripotency. For example, the use of transcriptional regulators or um, targeting um, the cell cycle regulators as well have shown improved engraftment of hematopoietic stem cells in mouse models. Targeting telomerase regula regulators have also shown to improve engraftment. Chromatin modifying agents that alter the DNA methylation and histone deacetylation results in improved expansion of HSCs. Next, at the same time, attempting to identify potential target genes through lentiviral short pin um, hairpin RNA knockdown libraries is also another area of active research. Um, I'm proud to say that Singapore General Hospital leads a first in human clinical trial using a novel small molecule to expand the hematopoietic stem cells in Cortland for uh, patients with hematological malignancies who require a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and who lack a HLA compatible donor. And this study is currently led by Dr. Suditu, Dr. Pro, uh, Professor William Huang and myself. 
And this was really the first report of the use of a novel azo-based small molecule designated C7, which is able to promote the successful expansion of hematopoietic stem cell progenitor cells from umbilical cord blood, MNCs. And this is done without the co-cultural mesenchymal stromal stem cells or prior CD34 enrichment and yet is able to demonstrate significant expansion of the hematopoietic stem progenitor cells and supported by accelerated primary and sustained secondary engraftment in NSG mines. So from my point of view, I have created two slides. This is one of them to basically share um, how I see the journey of HSCT and its lessons as a transplant physician and, and what, um, how we can interpret this and move forward. So for example, the source of stem cells we have learned now from bone marrow, how we can get them from peripheral blood and cord blood, and obviously from um, through the understanding of the HLA using haploidentical donors to then uh, obtain a greater source of stem cells that can be used to treat patients with relapsed refractory uh, blood cancers in the leukemia and lymphoma setting. The collection process and the manipulation, a bone marrow harvest is highly invasive where the patient needs to be under general anesthesia and the harvest done in an operating theater. Then comes about using uh, mobilizing agents such as GCSF and Parexafor to aid in the mobilization of stem cells into the peripheral circulation to then um, uh, be able to um, obtain these through a central line catheter and, and store it for future use. And obviously, if patients fail, um, you know, a uh, 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 peripheral um, harvest, then obviously looking at cord blood is another area um, to provide these stem cells. And during this process, you can then see that there are manipulations that are done, some of which are not um, advanced manipulation, but box standard things that we need to do in order to make sure that whatever goes into the patient is safe and purified to such an extent um, to obviously aid in the success of the stem cell transplant. And therefore, for example, in the bone marrow harvest, we do do red cell depletion for cord blood as well. There's a red cell depletion mechanism that is done. Um, we then look at uh, T cell depletion, alpha beta depletion, um, and obviously, as mentioned before that, how we can expand cord blood to get enough progenitor cells to then render the transplant possible. Conditioning regimens, you know, it is really about disease eradication and to aid engraftment. Hence, you are playing with the immune system um, by obviously uh, this GBL and GBHD, and it's a balance between both. And obviously, as you see, as mentioned, myeloablative regimens versus reduced intensities versus non-myeloablative, all of this will accumulate into a reduction in mortality. Infusion-related reactions, we know that we use DMSO to obviously cryopreserve the stem cells and you know, patients are obviously prehydrated uh, to ensure that they don't develop the toxicities from DMSO, which can cause acute uh, kidney injury. We also check their renal function after that. There may be an immune-mediated cytokine-related reaction after the stem cells are also infused into the patient. And then we have come about to understand how do we determine the success of the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And this is really true engraftment, where we define early, late um, engraftment or whether that's even graft failure, be it primary or secondary. And a lot of this has come back to the fact that where do you actually get your hematopoietic stem cell uh, source from? You know, your cell dose is very important the source, the donor for it, and understanding how you can use the conditioning regimens to aid engraftment, as well as um, the disease itself plays a role uh, as to whether the patient will engraft. So for example, in somebody who has myelofibrosis, you wouldn't recommend using cord blood as a form of stem cells. And secondly, um, you know, with this kind of disease, you also need to be, that is something that you will monitor uh, for um, early, for engraftment failure. And obviously the complications post engraftment, both short and long-term, acute graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease, um, infections that we see, uh, CMV reactivation, uh, late uh, parvovirus in the cord blood uh, setting, HHV6, um, and the use of vaccinations uh, later on, 
um, and then of course looking at disease relapse, secondary graft failure, secondary cancers that can also happen. So this is really what the patient actually undergoes uh, when they actually come for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And then from there, we then look at the immune effector cells and its progress as well, where we know that this has been built on the foundation of the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And again, if you look initially on the previous slide, it was the source of your donor cells. Over here, in a way, it is the same thing, but it's the source of your immune effector cells. Where do you get these immune effector cells from? Is it from peripheral blood from the patient itself? Or is it from a cord blood? You, you can even use your induced pluripotent stem cells, as mentioned before. And again, comes back to your whole understanding of your H. A barriers, whether it can be independent of your HLA, uh, TCR knockout, therefore you do not get this whole um, allo reactivity with T cells, uh, use of NK, use as use of gamma delta cells, and these are truly allogenic off the shelf uh, sources of cells for IEC. In terms of collection process and manipulation, as mentioned previously, you know, in the previous site, bone marrow harvest using GCSF, Perexafol to mobilize stem cells because the numbers are small. Whereas over here, we are talking about your immune infector cells, whereby they are not in large quantities, but you don't need GCSF to mobilize them. Um, you can get them from peripheral blood and you can get them from cord blood. However, there is a process behind that whereby you then select out the cells that you want to be using. So for example, you select out your T cells, you then expand these cells in culture, you may then want to activate them or genetically manipulate them uh, and so on and so forth. And obviously before it goes back into the patient, you may want to uh, freeze the cells down. However, your free store mechanism must be robust enough whereby whatever viability viability you are starting off with when you freeze and upon thawing, the viability is still um, intact. Um, before that, I mentioned about all the conditioning regimens, whereas in the immune setting or in your adoptive um, cell therapy, you are looking at a lymphodepleting regimen and a lot of it has always been using cyclophosphamide, fludarabin, uh, and nowadays uh, even bendamustin. And really this will aid the expansion of your immune effector cells that go into a patient by creating your cytokine milieu that is important for these cells to expand and at the same time um, suppress the patient enough such that these, uh, there is engraftment that can occur as well. Infusion related reactions, again we use DMSO to cryopreserve these cells. We are familiar with the immune mediated uh, reactions such as uh, cytokine release syndrome and, and uh, the neurotoxicity as well. Over here, we don't look at engraftment, but we do look at the cellular kinetics of these immune effector cells that go into patients. Um, and really they are governed by your cell dose. How much do you put into patients? How much is deemed enough to get the job done? How much is deemed too much that you actually get more of the side effects than you want? The source and the donor is important because again, um, if it is an allogenic, off-the-shelf uh, donor source that you are dealing with, then you are dealing with a possibility of allo reactivity, you are dealing with a possible uh, rejection and, um, and non-persistence. And then you look at the cytotoxic properties of these immune effector cells, uh, whereby then you get your cytokine-related responses, proliferation of these immune effector cells, as well as the persistence. And then you're looking at um, your lymphodepletion in terms of the cellular kinetics as well as the disease involved that you plan to treat. And lastly, uh, at the complication short and long term, and honestly at this point of time we are familiar that uh, patients who receive lymphodepleting regimens do get relatively neutropenic uh, and therefore again gives rise to these infections, opportunistic infections or bacterial infections. We are now seeing as we treat more patients with immune uh, cell therapies that they do develop cytopenia, so which the mechanism is not very clear, but they do develop thrombocytopenia and they do uh, develop neutropenia. And again, this will have impact on the risk of infections for these patients. Disease relapse, again, I think it's governed by um, your disease, um, your, your primary disease that you are treating, um, and that is something that needs to be monitored as well. 
whether you get acute graft versus host disease, chronic graft versus host disease, as well as secondary cancers, I think this is something that is ongoing and only time will tell. So the strategies for some stem cell therapy in cancer, so we just mentioned about hematopoietic stem cells and how uh, when that goes into patients with leukemias and lymphomas, yeah, you can uh, uh, give rise to this graft versus tumor effect, graft versus host disease. Other areas uh, that are obviously being looked into are things like mesenchymal stem cells and neural stem cells, which are used to um, uh, used to actually deliver certain uh, drugs to actually then target cancer cells. And they can also be genetically modified to kill cancer cells. Um, and they, as well as uh, develop um, oncolytic virus or, or cancer uh, vaccines. Um, as mentioned before my talk, induced pluripotent stem cells, these can obviously be used to then make your immune effector cells such as your T cells and NK cells and then genetically modify these cells to then target the cancers. This is a table just to show that currently MSCs are being used to uh, reduce graft versus host disease. Um, and you can see that patients who have relapse, uh, sorry, refractory uh, GBHD received um, MSCs and you can see different doses, um, some of them with some good responses, some of them just showing um, early phase one data that it is safe to actually give MSCs but efficacy is yet to be uh, proven in these clinical trials. So to summarize um, in the take-home messages of my presentation today, uh, I hope that you all have been able to appreciate the biological roles of stem cells, um, of which I provided a brief update on their diverse applications, the scientific advancements in stem cell biology that are currently being driven by the current intellectual ferment and excitement of the field, but when and how these advances will be translated into successful treatments remains fertile questions for debate. In the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, um, I hope I have managed to impress upon you all the effectiveness of this for hematological cancers, and at the same time, how the science and the limitations of HSCT really forms a foundation for further innovations and a greater understanding in stem cell therapies. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>